It's not a new topic. We've, we've, we've been struggling with this for, uh, for at least 400 years, but we're going to get the views of some uh, uh, genuine, bona fide industry leaders. There aren't three people that I admire more or respect more than these people. They are genuine industry leaders. We have Brian Weldy with HCA, Sandy Smith with Hogue, Bob Mitch, Sutter. A management philosopher said some years ago, if, if you think you're a high achiever and you're not standing on the leading edge, you're taking up too much space. These guys are not taking up too much space. So here's the way we'll work it. Uh, I'll bring up a question. We're gonna ask each one of these uh, guys to address that question, and when they've addressed it, we'll ask the audience to address it as well. Then we'll go to question two and three and four, and we'll keep going uh, until we get thrown out. So question one, it's common knowledge that, that uh, before we learn to lead, we must learn to follow. So I would be interested in having each of these people tell us some leadership characteristics that they have seen in others that they admire and think are useful. So Brian. You know, I think the first thing that really stood out at me and helped me develop me as a leader was that the person that, that I worked for showed a great amount of respect. I mean, just simple, a simple email would always have my first name in it would listen to me and understand what I had to, to contribute and would really think about that as, as a viable option or alternative. So I felt listened to, respected, and that skill just stuck with me, resonated with me that as a benefit of that engagement that I could you know, give to others as well. Yeah, I think in my life um, and in the different, um, different fields that I've been in, um, the, the people who have really had an impact for me um, from a leadership standpoint are people that are curious and they they sort of they're, they're interested truly interested in the work that you're doing and why you're doing it and they draw that out and um, I think that's such an important skill for leaders um, to, to have interest I think a lot of times we we get involved in our jobs on a daily basis and it's just doing it but we've we've lost the from a leadership standpoint being able to sort of you know be truly interested in the work and, and having that curiosity is a great skill. Bob? For me, I've uh, actually, I think, picked up a majority of my leadership skills from the people that I've worked for. And I've had 10 bosses in my time at Sutter Health, uh, amazingly survived uh, all 10 of them. But uh, the two most uh, admirable characteristics that I picked up from most of these uh, gentlemen and ladies was low ego. Um, and that they had big ears, and getting to the listening component of this, I felt it was really uh, genuine leadership to listen to other people, engage them, and take their ideas and their concepts, and and let good people do their work, so they didn't have to to have their ego at the forefront of every conversation or every issue. Interesting, audience members, leadership characteristics that you have seen in others that you felt like were powerful. Who, who, who will share with us? Passion. Very powerful. Passion sells. Uh, I noticed that last night during the karaoke singing. <laughs> There were a few participants whose work was, was, was injuring me, <laughs> but they had great passion. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? Robin. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a very powerful idea, isn't it? To feel understood. Any other thoughts? I'll take a little credit. Loud and clear communication is what you get. 
Yeah, the, 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 the freedom to error. Right. Yeah. Don. That, 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 that's a powerful idea. Let's, let's, let's run that by, by our experts. The, e, e, every one of you are with high-performing organizations. So, so where does, how does vision play into the leadership role? I, I think what Don just said uh, resonates incredibly with what we've been trying to do organizationally. And you've seen a lot of presentations about how to make efficient the work that we're responsible for. And we're all very good at managing construction and acquiring real estate and doing those sorts of things. But how are we connecting that work to the goals of the organization? And I think that's one of the most challenging aspects, particularly in the industry that we're in, mission driven. We're not on the front lines of taking care of patients, a variety of things. And so how, figuring out how to connect what we're doing and make an impact in those places is I think kind of the essence of what we're responsible for as leaders for doing. Interesting. Sandy? Yeah, I think, um, you know, taking the time out to sort of ground um, the various teams that you have and, and, you know, again, not just necessarily your direct report teams, but, you know, we, we always try and take uh, time to go out to our job sites and to gather the construction teams and remind them that the things that we're putting into service are more than just a construction project. Um, it provides meaning and it gets higher performance as a result. And it's, it's interesting, because I have a couple of clinical departments that report to me as well. Um, and even there, uh, you know, you find that people can get pretty siloed in their work, and they lose sight of sort of the bigger connection. And um, I think when leadership goes out and, and spends the time to sort of connect them and to prepare them for the future, you know, the things that are going on in, in the industry, a lot of what we've talked about here uh, over the last couple of days, um, uh, and, you know, I wrote lots of notes, things that I want to take back, but it's incredibly powerful um, to take back. So it's not just the design and construction teams, but it's throughout the enterprise. You know, I, I think a vision really has to have the two parts of both the mind and the heart with it, the emotional aspect of it. So, uh, you know, understanding what that means as an organization. I mean, every organization has its sort of DNA associated with how it operates. So, as a leader, it's understanding what is the vision of the organization I work for. Maybe you have somewhat of a sub vision that supports the main vision. But the, the idea behind the vision itself is, is there something behind it that's a head thought process as well as a heart process, emotion process. But also it's important that as you, as you talk about that, that you keep repeating yourself. Leaders have to repeat themselves over and over and over again. And they know they've got it right once they start hearing what they've said, come back to them in the same words that they've used. If you don't hear that coming back to you, you're not using it enough. It may seem like you're repeating yourself over and over and over again, but that's what a leader has to do is repeat that vision, that tactic, and that strategy that's necessary for the organization. Fascinating. Any other comments about the connection between corporate vision and leadership? Okay, next topic. Um, one of the things we've been discussing for 400 years, I mean, not me personally, I've only been involved for about 150 years, but we argue all the time about can we make leaders or do we find them? So. Each one of these organizations is, 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 uh, is led powerfully. So I would like for e each one of you to, see, to, to give us your thoughts on um, what your company can do to uh, manufacture leadership. Start with you, Brian. You know, so make versus found, I, I think both of those go together. This, this complicated aspect of leadership is it depends on what kind of a leadership role that you take. Uh, if you're in a leadership role that you're an auditor for a company, you're a kind of a fact finder person, you have to be absolutely right, you're going you're gonna to lead a group that has that sort of thinking. If you're more of a problem solving innovation group that's a quick start, you'd be leading a different kind of group that operates differently. So it's not a one size fits all, but it's more about how do you understand, first of all, the culture and the assignment of the leadership role. And then based on that, then there are certain characteristics you're born with. Are you introvert, extroverted? Skills that have that is a good job match with that. 
And then how do you learn some skills that you don't have? So you have to be very teachable as a leader to learn and develop yourself all the time. The minute you stop being teachable is the minute you're going to stop being an effective leader. So you've got to also be humble to be able to be taught, which sometimes is hard. As you get more experience, you tend to think that my, my ideas and solutions are always going to be right because of experience. But that's actually the other way around. There's a lot of people outside the organization. As I've mentioned before, the smartest people probably don't work for your organization because they're out here, like in this audience here, or someplace else to gather that to make you a better leader. Andy, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think that there are certain characteristics that, that leaders have that are innate. Um, they may be closeted, and they have to be set free. Um, but, uh, you know, I think some people are comfortable with, with a leadership responsibility, and it is a responsibility. And I think other people don't, and they get very uncomfortable, and there are people sometimes that you recognize in your organization that you think have great capability, and you, you try and develop them, but, but they never sort of take the bait. They never sort of rise because it's not in their comfort zone. So I think it's a very interesting balance, um, but I think there are lots of things that are very, um, I, w I wouldn't say teachable, but things that you can cultivate in a person to allow them to to let it out and to reach their own potential. And I think, um, I think that's one of the characteristics of leaders is they can identify capabilities and develop that, right? And so the first question, you know, what, what are the things? Um, in, in our experience, at least in my experience, um, you know, the people who allowed that to come out, because I'm an introvert, um, I'm very introverted, and you know, I never would have been comfortable, but somebody recognized something and, and allowed me to, you know, figure out that I could stand in front of a, a room full of strangers and I was still, you know, introverted, it was still okay, um, and allowed me to, um, you know, develop myself. Um, so, I don't know if that That's made a any powerful sense. idea. We, 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 we'll come back to that later, but the idea of uh, the, the difference between attempting to train a leader and, and, and cultivating behaviors that are already probably living in there. What do you think, Bob? Well, I agree as well that there are probably certain personality traits that are innate to, to leaders. And I, like Sandy, am an introvert and probably wasn't destined for leadership, but someone kind of plucked me and saw something in me. And um, it, I, wasn't, I wasn't comfortable initially in the early parts of my career in certain settings doing you know, leadership behaviors. And so, I attended the Sutter Health Leadership Academy. This was later in my career, uh, but it's an opportunity. Sutter Health does believe you can make leaders, but those leaders are typically identified uh, as having potential first before they enter into the Leadership Academy. And I, I truly feel like um, you can make a leader, you can draw out the aspects of, of leadership that people might have and contained within them, buried within them. Um, I feel like my, my biggest growth, I was always a very competitive person, but I didn't necessarily want to tell people what to do. I just kind of wanted to demand it, and I turned that and learned how to behave in a way where I could draw people along and collaborate uh, and be the listener and the low ego person that was necessary in order to actually have a team that would be thriving and succeeding. So I'm, I'm a grown leader, I would say. We'll come back to that in a second. That's pretty interesting. Um, Anybody here work for a company that has a formal leadership development program like Sutter has? <clears throat> Tell us how that works at your place. Is that university-wide, you mean, or just the, the health care? Is it, is, it, is it well regarded as being effective? Interesting. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
it up with Lily for her to tell me about it. And so, um, I think it's just a wonderful program. I love our program. I think it's just a wonderful um, environment to have to offer to people who are looking for something to do or that have been looking for something to do. I want to continue to offer that to people who are looking for something to do or to do have the chance to do something to do that they have been looking for something to do. So I think I think um, that's what I would sort of offer as sort of like a dialogue question to people who are looking for something to do. But um, try to think of some sort of like opportunity that you have to think of that you can try to share with people. So most of the things that we did started as smaller things that people had wanted to do. So we were looking at curriculum who teaches in in that program um, they have a, a department of human law and ethics honors program that they teach and they do curriculum um, for both sections of it um, and they sort of they are trying to not that they would describe it but they basically what it does is they do um, they describe a some classical therapy Yeah, that's that's a tricky row. Don, what did what does Kaiser do? Yeah, I can imagine. Yes, sir. Interesting. So that's a major, to, to get admitted is a major career achievement. Interesting. Anybody else who's been through a, um, whose company has a, a formalized leadership program? For those, uh, one more question before we leave this idea. For those people who have experienced that, what, of all the things they tell you, Bob, in your 18 months of that, what what impacted you the most? 
I think there were probably two things. Uh, the, um, the readings were intense and it, we, we were assigned a coach dur the, during the entirety of the process to talk to you on a, on a monthly basis about how, how you could improve. Um, we did a 360 that included the people that work for us as well as our bosses, peers, and other influential people within the organization. Getting that feedback was one aspect of it for me that was really important and eye-opening because it identifies the blind spots that you might have about the way that you lead that others might find frustrating or ineffective. And so that was a huge learning. But one of the, of the many books that we read, and I think there were 30 that were required, uh, the servant leadership model uh, and all the tenets that make up that philosophy resonated the most with me in terms of it really flipped the switch for me with regard to if I can figure out what my people need and provide that to them, they're going to be successful and therefore I'm successful. And just that philosophical light bulb going off in probably 2010 approximately when I read that book was huge for me. Sam? I, I just, um, it, it just kind of triggered a thought. Um, it, when, when I was at Toyota, um, as part of their leadership development, um, I got sent to Japan for a month um, where I actually built cars um, for a week and came home and thanked my mother for sending me to college so I didn't have to do that. <laughs> uh, it was really hard work. Um, but that was part of their leadership program um, and pretty much anybody that's an executive at Toyota in Japan has gone through and they have to work on the line. It's part of what they have to do. And if you, if you take that into healthcare, and so we're not obviously gonna be doctors and you know, do brain surgery, but um, we think about the facilities that we create and a lot of the things that we sort of discount because we don't, we're not the engineers, we're not the EVS staff, we don't do a lot of the different things, but if we, if we spent a week in those roles and took our teams through that, they might have a very different sort of empathetic sort of perspective. And again, I think in terms of um, developing the leadership capabilities that can lead a broad organization that's very multi-dimensional, um, boy, that, that sort of hands-on, a, a lot of us have skipped that step. And um, I think that would give an interesting sort of grounding. Very powerful idea. Brian, your thoughts about this? Well, you know, the, the area of uh, HC has a, has a leadership development process as well, but kind of stepping back and looking at it from our organization and probably for all of you is, you know, all of us is, you know, why do we go in leadership in the first place? Uh, and are, is it a good match for us? I mean, if you think about leadership, it's a great opportunity to leverage some things. You've got resources, you have people that work with and through you to accomplish some, some great things. So that's a fascinating part of leadership. The other side of it, though, is, is now you become a lightning rod for a lot of other issues. Uh, you now you have to be held accountable to budgets, to people, to issues. And so that has some aspects of it you have to wrestle with as well. Also, you, the friendships you had before you became a leader will change. Now you may be their boss, or it's just the dynamics of your new role changes dramatically. So you're a little bit lonelier, so you have to come to groups like this to get some rehab, <laughs> to, to kind of get, you know, feel good about yourself again before you go back to the office. But, but just realize those dynamics. It's very exciting to be into leadership and to be trained to do that, because you have a lot, you can do a lot of things that you couldn't do, as, but you just realize there are some trade-offs in, in that journey. Fascinating. Okay, shall we switch topics? Here's one, here's one that's uh, always good for a bar fight, and that is, do the leadership characteristics that we learned when, 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 when we were young, do they need to be revised now to lead this current generation of, of workers? Does leadership, has to does, does leadership have to evolve with time and with um, generational change? I believe so, and, it, and it's hard because, I mean, if you think about at my age group going through was the idea that everyone that you lead probably should be in close proximity to where you work. Everybody drives in, everybody's together. Obviously, we didn't have the connectivity that we have today, so it's the idea, how do we now work in a very digital world, and that has also another side of it, is now it allows you to, to outreach to some talents you didn't have access to before, because before they had to physically be in some location to connect to your home office or to a satellite office. But now you can have access to talent throughout the world 24 seven. 
So how do you think about that? How do you crowdsource expertise in your organization? And how do you get comfortable with that? I believe that's where the trend is, is to get the best experts in various aspects to be part of your team in some kind of way that will help you move forward with that. And it might be really actually pretty cost effective. You might not need a full-time person's expertise to be part of your team, and you can part-time get that expertise in your group. So it's a whole new way of thinking, but it, it is a struggle because there is this tendency that we want everyone under our wings to be sure we know where everybody's at and what they're doing to where it's a much more virtual, connected society in which we have to adjust more down the road. What do you think, Shane? Yeah, so I think it's um, it, it, it's kind of an interesting thing. I've never considered myself, I was always a very mediocre student. Um, I've never considered myself a subject matter expert in anything. So I've always looked to other people to um, you know bring their expertise and talents to bear. And I think, um, you know, again, I, I started with curiosity. I think I've always been curious and um, working with, um, Young young people uh, today, um, so I don't. I, I think I never grew up, um, and so you know, working with young people seems very natural, and um, and just sort of is part of that. You know, my evolutionary process. Um, I I had a guy that worked worked for me. Does not work for me any longer, um, but you, you know, he came from a pretty strict military background, and. He wanted to be told what to do. You know, what? Give me the orders, and I will execute the order, sir. And it's like I am not the big giant head. I, you know, I don't know. If you need me to tell you what to do, you're the wrong guy. And you know, we emancipated each other. Um, and uh, you know, he's gone on to have a great career. And I think that's part of leadership as well, right? So sometimes there's the misfit in the organization, and it doesn't mean the people aren't good. And I think. Part of leadership is, you know, helping to identify those mismatches, organizational or cultural, and and to get them off in the right direction so they can achieve what they're capable of doing. Um, but I think this next generation is very interesting, and they come up with some really amazing stuff. Um, you know, it was uh, Michael's presentation. You know, about you know what are the eight-year-olds thinking? I mean, I think that's a really profound. I, I wrote that down. It's like, what are they thinking about? Um, and, you know, how do we sort of find that and cultivate that? Um, I don't know. I didn't answer your question, but that's what I think. I'm going to not answer it further. Um, I'm really mixed on this. I, I agree with Brian in that the way that we're operating very virtually, people are located at, at different sites that report to you, uh, you know, some as far as a couple hundred miles away. And the biggest aspect, or one of the biggest aspects, I believe, of leadership is the culture. And the culture is normally more about what you do than what you say. So I can say a lot of things in email, say a lot of things out loud at staff meetings, but they don't actually see me behave or see our leadership team behave on a daily basis. So how do you get the culture out to the folks that are remotely operating and make them feel connected to the group? I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we're, that we're facing. Um, and I, I totally agree with Sandy as well. It, it's 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 a, one of the biggest challenges. I enjoy working with younger people. I still feel like, hey, I'm right in the middle of this mess with you and like to roll up my sleeves with them and uh, enjoy the time that I'm working with them. But some of the basic things that make up, uh, you know, being accountable and, and communicating with integrity and all these core things that make people successful in business have to be taught, have to continue. Those things aren't changing. Interesting. Anybody, um, anybody think that management and leadership need to evolve? Anybody think management and leadership doesn't need to evolve? It is what it is.
Do you think your kids need a different kind of leadership than you needed when you were their age? Interesting. Anybody else think uh, that, 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 that your kids are looking for a different kind of leadership than you look for at their age? Interesting. Anybody else that thinks uh, leadership's evolving? Yes, sir. I've heard something uh, stated about that recently that, you know, you used to have a job for 30 years and then you may have six, work for six different employers over 30 years and the eight-year-olds may work for six companies at the same time. So the idea is promoting those skills. It'll be interesting to how to lead through those situations to where people ha may have multiple jobs at, at any given time versus just one long career at one company. No, I was just going to add on that. I think, um, you know, it's interesting because I think sometimes when we're selecting talent to come into our organizations, we we look for that stability and, and it's sort of like, okay, well, is that a strength or a weakness on a going forward basis? And, um, you know, again, I look at my own career. You know, I'm an architect. I never thought I'd be a hospital administrator. I didn't think I'd be a hospital administrator 11 years ago. And, um, you know, I think the ability to sort of be able to be adaptable and have this sort of nonlinear progression is, you know, maybe, I don't know everybody's personal stories, but, um, you know, I think that may be a skill set that's very valuable in terms of future leadership. Bob, any thoughts about this? You kind of got this, you got us started on this mess. <laughs> well, I, I'm, as we were leading up to this this discussion, I was I, I was actually everybody or a lot of people that I talked to in the conference. I was asking, so what was your background? How did you end up in these roles? And I was just surprised at the diversity of the responses. And you got really strong military leadership that you know worked in some level of engineering and made their way into this. You've got folks that uh, were real estate, you know, facilities management type of folks. Um, there were lawyers that had made it into these positions in these seats and what was, and I think the initial discussion was going to be focused on how are we going to develop our future leaders and it's very difficult because to come into these seats 
you have to have a very broad set of, of skills around real estate and FM and construction and all sorts of different aspects of it. Um, and even in get expanded roles like Sandy has where he has clinical departments reporting to him and he has an architectural background. Um, and so how do you organize around developing future leaders? And it was um, it, I, trying to prepare for this, it, I thought I'd get a pretty traditional or set of answers that you could see where the leaders came from and you really can't. And that gets back to the issue of you know, folks who have the you know, innate personality traits, folks who show some ability to, uh, to lead earlier in their career and get identified and picked up by a mentor and helped. Um, it's a very, very difficult question because what we do is so complex and so broad in, in terms of what we do that you don't come out of a business school ready to do this job. You don't come out of one aspect ready to do this job. And so we're very reliant as leaders upon the people that support us who are the content experts in each one of these realms. And I think being able to allow them to succeed and grow is probably the secret sauce of this whole thing um, in terms of leadership. So I didn't answer your question at all. I just went on my own way. But you never <laughs> answer my question. <laughs> this is not a new problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any other thoughts about uh, the evolution of leadership with time in this generation? Yes, sir. Bob. Very important difference. We, the difference between authority and power. Authority is granted to you from by your superiors. Authority is the right to hire pe certain people, fire certain people, sign certain contracts, spend a certain amount of money. That's authority. You get it from above you in the organizational structure. Power is the, is the ability to get something done. That is voluntarily gifted to you from your peers and your subordinates. It's voluntarily gifted, which is what uh, Bob just said. Substantial difference. And we've all seen organizations where the power, the, the person in power, does not match the person with authority. There'll be somebody with authority, but they, they, uh, they take off down the road and they look behind them and nobody's following. Okay, we got time for one more issue to get, to, to get started, which, uh, um, is, is, is really an important one, I think, particularly for people in our industry, and that is the relationship between the executives that lead the effort in a major uh, healthcare system, the executives that lead the effort of shaping the built environment, how they relate to the executives leading the effort to run the business of the, of the healthcare system, and the executives responsible for the care delivery. And nowadays we have to add IT. In the old days we didn't. There was there was there was management, there was care delivery, and there was the built environment. Now IT is just as big a circle in there. So here's the question: um, the relationship between the executives that lead the the, the shaping of the built environment and the C-suite of, of of major healthcare systems. How do we make a better and more powerful connection with them? Brian, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think the first thing is you really have to understand what their issues, priorities, challenges, pressure points are for them. Also, to really understand the culture in which you work with them, because as, as I've heard said before, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast or for lunch. So you have to understand where they're operating from and how you align to that cultural situation. Uh, I would say that every, every boss, and my boss, I've had several bosses as well, and so each one has sort of their things that they really want to see from you and others could care less. It's always this adjustment period uh, of getting someone new for that, for that whole process. I, I think that you obviously want to make your boss look good. I think obviously you want to make the, them have a respect for you at, at the top of the organization that you are giving them good advice. If you're a leader and you're, you're speaking up 
chain from your responsibility, you want to have the credibility of being an advisor. You want to be able to give them good information, have credibility in that advice, and, and understand the risk associated with it. What I tend to like to do is to give trade-offs to decisions. It's very seldom is there like the best answer. There are several options, but the good thing is that you can explore those options, but communicate those options very clearly. We can do this, but here are the trade-offs. We can do that, here are the trade-offs. And you might even make a recommendation, but at least they felt that you've done your work to advise them to have a good, a good basis of decision. I think the worst things you can do as a leader is to go up to your superiors with onesie twosie problems and, and not really deal with systematically from understanding the company's culture and strategy, how you plug into that and how you can create this sort of overarching uh, woven in strategy to their advantage. And if they see you as a valuable resource that way, I've seen that that makes a big difference. Do, 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 typically, when do, are are your superiors ever are, are they very good at giving you clear marching orders? Do they say, Brian, we want you to we want you to we want you to feed us this kind of information, or do they leave that up to you to decide? Uh, generally, leave that up to me. So it's really you have sort of overarching idea of what they want to have. They leave it up to me to be able to come with them with opportunities and why we want to do that in the trade offs. So it's really up to me to bring that idea up to them. Interesting. What do you think, Sandy? So you, this kind of reminds me of uh, you know the interview question uh, when I was at Hope when I was coming to Hope, um, and I, I basically I said you know my job at Toyota at the time is to be the trusted advisor to the organization, and that's that's my role. That's that's the role of my team. Um, we're here to advise you and you know to execute that work but th that's really our role and if if we can have a trusting relationship um, you know at sort of all dimensions of the organization um, and we can be viewed that way then we will be successful together um, and and again I think um, it, it's a really interesting problem because I think sometimes we get, as experts in our subject matter, experts in, in our area, we tend to think about solutions that are not necessarily, um, we can get trapped into solutions that aren't necessarily in the best interest of the organization. That, that trusted advisor role means that we have to present those options. We could do this, but we suggest that you do this, you know, maybe something different. Um, and um, again, I think as we, as I've tried to shape my organizations over time, that's really kind of where I want them to be. And then the other is really to be committed to um, the kind of the notion that, um, you know, we're good, but there is no best, there's only better. Um, you know, we can always be better. And so um, being open to the notion of we, we d even if we are subject matter experts, we don't know everything. And you know, how do we avail ourselves to you know, kind of a mindset that is, um, again, always curious and is always sort of exploring not just what's happening today, but you know, the Bitcoin of tomorrow and what those impacts are going to be. Interesting. What do you think, Bob? Well, in terms of uh, communicating with the C-suite and having a presence, at least maybe not in the room where decisions are being made and sometimes strategy is being proposed. Um, I have found my success in, in developing individual relationships with these different leaders. And as I mentioned previously, I had t I've had 10 bosses since I've been at Sutter Health. And I think it was my ninth boss said, you report to me on paper, but I know you don't really report to me. You're just going to go wherever you want in the organization for whatever you need, and I don't expect you to try to take things through me. Um, and that that has been my success, and I have different relationships with our CEO, our CFO, the two operating unit presidents, the, the president of System Enterprise. Everybody has different personalities and things they want from me. Uh, in terms of output and, they, and, and knowledge and information. And so I'm adjusting my game on, on all levels in order to meet the expectations of different people who all come from different backgrounds, some physicians. I report to a physician currently, the president of System Enterprise. Um, and that's, I think, been the key to my success. I would love to have been given designated authority from the organization. You're now 
you know, responsible for these, you make all these decisions, and that it's just not the way it works in our organization, nor I don't believe in any other organization. You have to go and collaborate and communicate concepts, ideas, changes in the way that we do things with the key stakeholders, and you've got to be able to have those conversations and create a level of trust. And so I think that's what's allowed me to stay at the company for 25 years, is that um, I've been able to establish those sorts of relationships, and as those leadership positions turn over, those mentors, uh, the old timers who've moved on that I've known for 20 years, and it seems like every other week I'm going to a retirement party these days, and someone new is stepping in that seat, and often they're younger than me, they're very aggressive, they're wanting data in a different way than I've provided it previously, and so you just kind of have to work that relationship, that new relationship, so it's a challenge in terms of uh, constantly staying in good stead and in a good communication space with the different C-suite members, but um, I think that uh, that's been, I think, probably the reason why I've stayed so long. That's a powerful idea, adjusting to, 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 to the new environment as, as the C-suite changes and evolves. Powerful idea. Any, any thoughts about relationship with the C-suite here? Uh, one final question. Does everybody in this room feel comfortable sitting across the desk from the CFO at your company and having an intelligent conversation about what he or she is worried about? Can you speak enough CFO to, to, to communicate with these people? Everybody can do that. Do you speak enough care delivery model to speak to the physicians? Do we speak enough corporate strategy to be able to speak to the CEO? All right, that's, that's pretty impressive. I thought I saw a hand in the back. Um, okay, uh, the, the, Yes, it does. I, yeah, I have gotten a, a lot better at it. And, I, and early on, I I was big on giving information, and I, I would lose my audience, and rather than just giving the solution. And so once I started, I felt like in order to gain trust, I had to explain fully and wholly what we were trying to accomplish. And it was way, way too much information, and I would lose people. Not that they didn't trust me, but they just didn't have time for that much information. And so I really had to. In fact, with our CEO, I got to the point where I reported to him for about four years, and he uh, changed me completely from bringing data and a bunch of information to bring the solution, only give me that one sentence, and if I want to ask you a question about it, I will. Otherwise, I trust you, now get out of my office. And so uh, <laughs> it really changed the way that I communicated with him, but there are other folks, like I said, that want a lot of data, they want a lot of information, prove it to me, why, show me the, you know, what happened, let's bring out the budget, let's look at it. And so it, it's just adjusting your game to each one, but I would say, yes, the way that I gain trust has evolved with folks, and I certainly appreciate the direct approach that the CEO taught me as well. Fascinating, Sandy, have you, have you had this same kind of uh, experience that Bob just mentioned? Where, where people tell me to shut up? Yeah. All the time. I throw you out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, playing to the audience and adjusting the message appropriately um, is a critical skill. And, you know, you do have um, wide diversity of styles and stuff, and people need information differently. Being able to tailor that, evolve it, um, is a really important, um, you know, you've got to customize to who your audience is. The, the only other thing I would say, um, so I get to sit in the C-suite um, with all those people and sit in all those meetings. We're a very, we're small hospital. Um, you know, it's just as dysfunctional in that room. I, I will be leaving here to go back to the senior management team meeting. Remember this communication. Yes, hi, <laughs> hi everybody. I'll be hi Robert, um, that's our CEO. Um, but it's just as dysfunctional as any other group, right? Everybody comes to the table with today's problem, their family issues, whatever, and um, you know you have to realize that they're just people, and 
you know, I think a lot of times stuff comes into us to get decisions made, and it's just, it's so off topic for the day. Um, sometimes I think, um, you know, if the, if the message isn't received, it may simply be timing. And again, I think that's where that trusted advisor, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta be really committed to those things and be able to, to bring that back. What do you think about this, Brian? Well, yeah, I think that uh, you have to be very malleable around who you report to. Uh, I mentioned before you have many people report to. You might have that fact finder that wants the absolute detail to have, have very strong confidence in the recommendation you're making. Others say, just give me a recommendation and get out of my office. So, you know, what kind of a boss do you have at the senior leadership is what you have to think about. Uh, second is that in the whole area of leadership, the, what you run into is things never turn out as they started. And so you have to understand that. You, you might have a great idea and a vision, you get started on it, and then team dynamics, funding, all these things get thrown into the mix as you're trying to execute and operate on a plan. So, so know that going to leadership that it's not gonna be step one, two, three, four, five, and I'm gonna be at the end result. Understand when you start at the very beginning, you're gonna have a problem. I was traveling not too long ago, and we had, we're, we're a Fortune 70 company, and so we bring all these people from out of town to come in for a board meeting in our building one there in Nashville. And all of a sudden we lost utility power and the whole building went off and we had emergency lighting and everything. So I had to basically relocate a board while I was out of town to a new building. And so I mean, you just don't anticipate those kinds of things. So the point of that in the leadership role is you're gonna get thrown a lot of tangents and it's, it's how you can adjust to those situations with your team, with your leadership, and as you go forward as a leader. Fascinating. Um, the official timing machine is, is now tired of us. Um, any, any, any more thoughts, questions before we close? Perfect, it's been a pleasure. You three are very impressive. I believed every word of it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.